and welcome to this week's uh, edition of Encompass Live. I'm Krista Burns, your host here at the Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Library Commission's uh, weekly online event. We cover any NLC activities or library-related activities that uh, librarians in the state may be interested in. We do these sessions every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time. It's a one-hour session on average, and it is free, so you can attend um, anytime you want to. Um, we do all sorts of different kind of things here, presentations, book reviews, web tours, Q&A sessions, maybe even mini train sessions, um, whatever we think that may be of interest to those of you out there. Uh, today, we are doing our session today is on computers, what to know before you buy. And um, Diane and Michael are here to talk about that. So I'm going to hand it over to you guys to go ahead. All right. Okay. And I'm busy. All right. Uh, Chris is going to adjust the camera for us. Uh, I'm Michael Sowers. I'm the technology innovation librarian here at the commission. Ooh, Zoom. Oh, wow. Uh, Zoom in. Everybody's clearly <laughs> not just now. I'm glad I, I'm glad I wasn't looking. <laughs> um, and I'll let Diane introduce herself real quick here. I'm Diane Wells. I work with the, I'm part of the computer team here at the Library Commission. Okay, great. Um, we, a lot of people don't know that the commission actually does have a web page floating around out there of of purchasing recommendations and we revised it recently here uh, kind of last summer and into this um, uh, winter here and I just figured what we could do is we could about that Diane and I, um, thanks really out us <laughs> well you know we want to keep it loose um, we I have notes I have yes notes. yes we have notes we're gonna walk through it um, there's there's the link at the, the on the last slide to the actual web page if you haven't found that already um, the PowerPoint slides that we'll be showing are literally almost the exact same text as what's on that web page so save yourself some ink don't bother printing out the PowerPoint slides uh, print out the web page when we're all done um, and we're going to go through the recommendations, but I know Diane and I don't always agree on the exact recommendations, and there's there's all sorts of things to think of. Oh, yes. Yes, that's the plan. We're going to kind of just riff off of each other. Also, we want to take your questions. Um, we're, hopefully, we'll have some time at the end, but if we say something you don't understand what the heck we're talking about, we haven't explained it well, speak up, either uh, raise your hand, and we'll call on you for audio, or send it in the text chat. We do have the text chat window open, and we will be looking at that as we're going through. Um, I suppose the, um, I'm going to hand it over to Diane to kind of tell you what kinds of computers we're talking about here today. Um, I guess basically what we're talking about here is the kind of computers that you might buy for, particularly for public access. The web page itself is designed to, um, to kind of give you an idea of just computer purchasing in general. And um, so that would, you know, perhaps include um, workstations for your staff um, but I think probably our um, our concentration will be more on public access and maybe even perhaps helpful in, in purchasing something um, for yourself but um, that's you know not our, not our main um, not our main point I guess one of the reasons that I thought this was, that I was Michael and I have talked about this page, for example, off and on, um, ever since he discovered it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when we revised it last summer. And I, I will say that, you know, I think that people are really, I'm intimidated when I go to buy a new computer. I, I know that, um, you know, just personally, that I don't feel like I know enough. And I don't, I don't know that anybody really feels 100% comfortable that they're going to, like, get a really good deal and that they're going to, like not have paid more than they should have paid for what they have, and did they get what they really need? And so I think one of the first things to note is um, what do you want it for? You know, and even if you just say, well, I want a public access computer, that's all fine, but what do you, what do you see people in your library wanting to do? What do you, do they primarily come in and do word processing projects? they come in and um, bring attachments that somebody attached to an email and for some reason they can't, their software at home doesn't allow them to do that so they brought a flash drive or, you know, or do they want to play games? Do they want to, you know, log onto a game site and play games? Do they, um, do they want to, you know, use some kind of phone software? What is it that they want to do? What is it as a public library that is no doubt 
uh, I mean, is, is a part of another organization, what are you able to allow them to do based on what your IT restrictions are? And that to me is, is it's a really hard area. And it's a place where Michael and I have an enormous number of conversations because I've been in, um, in government with limited, you know, where IT is pretty well, um, is pretty well restricted. And Michael, Michael's job is the newest, the brightest, the best. And so we constantly are trying to negotiate that line between what can we do and, and um, legitimately justify and what can't we. And um, so we understand that you, ha you too have that issue. You know, you may not be able to offer your patrons everything that they want to do. Not saying that you shouldn't do your best to try. But this will help you get the equipment to do what you can. And um, so those are, I guess those are the kinds of things that are important for me to just say up front because it is important to decide what it is you want to do. All right, um, before we get into start talking about specifications and things like that, um, I, I want to share one piece of advice that I have always given. Um, I, I look at purchasing computers, um, what some people consider backwards, but I've never had anybody come back to me and say, I'm, I wish you hadn't told me that. Um, it's always going to be cheaper, better, and faster a, a month from now. And, and in fact, I just bought a new desktop computer for a member of my household two nights ago. And for about the same computer I bought for myself in October, paid about half the price. So, you know, as frustrating as that is, we have to accept that. So what I always say is, is figure out what your budget is first. Um, figure out how much you're willing to spend. Because you can spend three grand on a computer if you really want to, but if you know you've only got 800 bucks, Already, you have to start adjusting your specs to, to match That's that. That's great. And you can get, I literally, 48 out, less than 48 hours ago, bought a computer that would meet every single spec and more of what we're talking about today um, for under $500. So it can it's be amazing. done. You do not have to spend a lot of money. All right, so let's go ahead here and start working us through this. And so we'll start with some desktop recommendations uh, that we have. And a lot of this will also apply to laptops. But we do have some slides about laptops uh, where you want to focus on a couple of issues. Okay, the processor. Um, we probably don't want to get into too much technical detail about no. how processors work. Thus, the link to Tom's hardware. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's those comparisons, and, and, and what, his explanation is, is going to be at least, as, at least as good as anything we can do because that is a great website for a computer hardware. Right. Um, mostly the couple of key phrases you want to be taking a look at right now is you have what's called dual core and quad core. And this basically has to do with the number of CPUs on the central chip. Um, I've been buying quad core. Um, dual core is perfectly fine, mainly because most software today won't take advantage of the fact that you have basically four computers under the hood on that central chip. But, you know, future proofing, maybe if you can, within your budget, get a quad core, you might be able to get a little more longevity out of your computer. Right. Then also you want to talk about, the, you want to look at the processor speed, and what we've recommended here is 2.4 gigahertz or higher. And or higher is going to be pretty easy these days. And or higher is going to be easy these days. And if you want to go a little lower, that's fine too. The computer I just bought is 2.2 gigahertz. Really, is is you want at least two point something, I would say. And to be honest, to get into a three point something, you just jumped a thousand dollars. Um, we haven't found that. But you haven't maybe, found that yet? No. Okay. Oh, I don't well. believe that we found that. Prices have changed then. <laughs> well, the prices may have changed, and the other thing is because you were purchasing as a private citizen, that's a totally, totally different thing than having purchased an op purchasing options as a government entity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So that's the other thing to know is that if you're willing to purchase like online from a manufacturer, local and county and state, federal government have special programs that they have in line with major computer manufacturers. And you can find out about those from your city purchasing department, mm -hmm. I would think, and um, be able to compare prices. Now, sometimes the problem with that is that there are limited, um, we can almost always go get something that is what we need for less in the consumer market 
but it won't have the longevity. It won't have whatever. And we can get we need to get some warranty options and some other things going through the government purchasing part of like the, um, a particular manufacturer or a particular vendor um, may also have that. And so we haven't really found that we're adding a thousand dollars to get okay. up above three um because with the packages that are offered on the government site sometimes that's just the package that you have granted okay so, that, just yep. so you know that okay i'm not used to government purchase exactly so. <laughs> you're a private sector guy uh, yeah i know i fly to things from tiger direct a lot yeah. um okay the operating system at this point, you're buying Vista. I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. We're going to see what Diane thinks, but um, there are computers you can buy where it downgrades to XP. Okay, Vista's been out for well over two years now. Do not downgrade to XP. Buy Vista unless, I'm going to throw this in, if, for example, your integrated library system, your vendor says, we will not work on Vista. Okay, then that's an issue. Yeah, that is we, mission critical software. These are public, yeah, and so but, if your OPAC is dependent on that, yes. then. Yep. But your public access machines at this point, Windows Vista. Now, there are about seven different versions of Vista. <laughs> uh, we honestly recommend Windows Vista Business. Um, even though home premium, if you're going to go at a home computer, home premium will completely do the job. Home basic is horrible. Um, but Vista has some benefit, or excuse me, Vista Business has some benefits in the networking environment where really in the library you want the business. Now, then we also say here, or Ultimate Edition. Which is all those things. Which is all those things and a little more. And my recommendation is this. If it comes with Ultimate, don't complain. But don't spend any extra money for Ultimate. You're yeah, not going to get that's... any benefit out of Ultimate that you will even notice ultimate kind of failed miserably with what they were going to offer. I bought ultimate. I'm talking from experience here. I paid the premium for ultimate and I got nothing out of it. So I, it's not worth it. The other issue, which I did add to our slide here is there is actually what's called 32 bit windows and there's 64 bit windows. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I've been buying 64-bit Windows. I think Krista just bought a computer with 64-bit Windows. More and more computers are coming with 64-bit Windows. The benefit comes to when you start dealing with memory, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Again, if your mission-critical software will not run on 64-bit, then that's a reason to stick with 32-bit. And that's a question you definitely want to ask. Right. And even, you know, even if you're the software that you're intending to put on public access machines, which isn't mission critical in um, in a business sort of way, but certainly in a customer service way it right. is, you know, you need to know that. You need to know whether that software is going to run or not, the software you're depending on, especially if you purchase software and you want to be mm -hmm. able to um, load it. Right. Load existing software on the new computer. Now, most 32-bit software will run perfectly fine on 64-bit. What you want to look for is not something that says it will run on 64-bit. You want to look for something that says it will not, not run on 64-bit. Uh, it's kind of a backwards compatibility issue. My home computer is 64-bit. I have found one piece of software in the last six months that will not run on my 64-bit computer, and that's actually the software for my Sony eBook. Um, so, well, and I would have to say that Michael was a great test case for this because, if, if I mean, I'm sure his home computer has many more things on it than his work computer, and we're constantly doing, you know, <laughs> Michael's got a lot of stuff. Yep. So, um, don't necessarily be nervous about this. What's this 64-bit? We'll explain why in just a sec here, but check on that. Um, okay. So, is Vista Business a 64-bit version of Windows? Well, there's actually Business. 32-bit and there's business 64-bit. Yep. Right. So it's it's the same Vista, but it has to do with how the underlying code is written, basically. Um, and it will say right on the package, or it will stay in the specifications, 32-bit um, or 64-bit. My assumption would be as if it doesn't say either way, it's the 32-bit. Yeah, if it's a 64-bit, it will say the 64-bit. Now, why does that care? Well, let's we're, let's talk about RAM. Let's talk about our memory. Um, minimum two gigabytes of RAM. I, you can't yeah. go below that. Sorry, just things aren't going to run. And you'll see offers out there, and a lot of um, well, I, 
you do see offers out there for less. For yeah. You. And, you know, you get that 512 thing and whatever. Yeah. It's becoming less and less common as those are, those, as those are moving off the shelves. Right. But you will see that, but be sure you're able to get it to 2 gig. Sure, yeah. I mean, really, 2 gig, you're running Vista, you need 2 gig. Yeah. Now, okay, we then say 4 gigabyte if feasible. It's going to cost you a little more, but if you can get 4 gigabytes of RAM, that's great. More, the better. The more memory you have, the more programs you can run at the same time without slowing the machine down. Now, this is where the 32-bit versus the 64-bit comes into play. And it just becomes, it's a really... I think I can explain still. this. Okay. I, I, oh, let, let's see if I can do this. Okay, okay. I've been practicing on people. Um, <laughs> 32-bit version of Windows, you can, will only support up to 4 gigabytes of RAM. Okay. But that's total RAM in your system. When you talk about video cards, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, let's say you have a video card that is 512 megabytes or half a gigabyte. You can put four gigabytes of regular memory into your computer, but it's going to have half a gigabyte on the video card, and then it will only pay attention to the first three and a half on the main memory. So it's so if you have a gigabyte of RAM on your video card, it's only going to pay attention to three gigabytes of main memory on the computer. Not so bad. That's the limitation of the 32-bit. 64-bit Windows will support, I believe, up to 64 gigabytes of RAM. Yeah. So if you want more than four gigabytes of RAM in your computer, you have to have the 64-bit version of Windows. So I've got the 64-bit version of Windows, and I have six gigabytes of RAM in my computer. So, and, and I can crank that up higher if I ever want to. And how long are you planning to keep this computer? How long am I planning? Oh, boy. Uh, I used to be on like a four-year cycle. I'm more like five now. That's I see, and that's, that brings up what I think is a really, late. in addition to what are you going to do with it, how long do you think you're going to have to keep it? Yep. Because that goes to whether you do 32 or 64, because more and more applications are going to start requiring 64, more and more are going to start requiring, you know, all, there'll always be more RAM, there'll always be faster speed. I mean, as, I mean, just as you've seen the size of storage go from, you know, a floppy disk to <laughs> terabytes that you can carry in your pocket, that's the exponential um, speed at which these kinds of things are increasing as well. So if you have, if you're investing in a computer that you know is going to have to last five years, you're probably going to want to balance within the budget that you have to spend today what I need to do right now and what I and how I might what I might need to be able to do that for the next five Long years. Term. Right. And so that's the balancing point where you really want to actually think this whole thing through before you start looking for the good deal. Right. Okay. Hard drive. Um, okay. Get at least 120 gigabytes hard drive space. I, I mean, and the more the better. I mean, is really and what it comes you, down yeah, to. Yeah, and, and I can't imagine that you would even find anything out there that offered you less than that at oh, this point. Oh, at, at this point, actually, new computers right, are three, usually starting at, at 320, 20, yeah. if not 500 or 640. Um, here, here's going to be the key now, the difference maybe between home and staff and public. The public, in most cases, are not going to be storing files on your computers. Right. Therefore, you don't need as much space. On a home computer, you're going to probably start storing video files and audio files and all that, so you want the Photos. bigger hard drive. Photos, exactly. Stuff that sucks up that space in unbelievable. You know, I, I watch most of my TV downloading it off the internet. I need space. I need right. space to put all of those videos, and I do it in high definition, so in uh, 45 minutes of video is a gigabyte of space right. right off the top. Um, staff, probably somewhere in between. Do you allow staff to put music on their computers? and store photos there for work, or do you not? Um, but, yeah, um, get the biggest hard drive you can. <laughs> I really, yeah, really. And, you know, if you can get a smaller hard drive but increase the CPU speed for the public machines, get the slightly smaller hard drive. Again, public machines, people aren't going to be storing data on the machines. You just need space to install the software that you have. Right. Uh, 
Um, monitor, honestly, um, 17 inch or larger flat screen LCD monitor. Um, you almost can't get CRTs anymore. They're big. They're both really. Don't want them. And you don't want them. And you have exactly. to pay to dispose of them. Yeah. So um, I don't even I don't even know that there's any. Um, it used to be that there were some industries in which you know um, CRTs were preferred. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think that exists anymore. Yeah. I really think that LCDs are are it in terms of. Sure. Um, comment to throw in. Then I'm going to ask Diana a question. Um, the comment to throw in is that the computer I just got for under five hundred dollars did not include a monitor. <laughs> That's because we already had a flat panel, fifteen inch LCD monitor to go with it. You don't necessarily have to buy a new monitor with a new computer. If you've got old CRTs and they do the job. They will work with your new computer. I mean, yes, it's, it, you don't have to buy well, new monitors. As long monitors. as you have the right. Yeah, but as long as your VGA is what VGA you're going to have. Which I don't know that I could even get a video card that still doesn't have one. But no, they have VGA has not been replaced. Yeah. I have for Diane because I was thinking about this this morning. Do you have an opinion over uh, uh, rec uh, widescreen or standard four by three aspect ratio? Oh, you know, I, I do, and I I really do. I really like the 4x3, but that's what I grew up with, you know? That's the size of my TV screen. Okay. That's the size of the first computer screen. That's the size of everything I'm used to working with. And so that's what I have in my office. Um, I, I'm going to go the opposite. And see, I like and the widescreen. I, I know a ton of people who think that the widescreen is just the way to go, and it's much um, it's much handier. And part of a way to decide just to do this in general and the way that we um, we try to help people here decide whether they need widescreen or, or regular is, if, is what you're going to do because is the primary thing that you're going to do on this computer width intensive or length intensive do you have do you find yourself pulling the scroll bar to the left and right when you're doing a lot of your work if you do widescreen is what you want to do but if you don't then um uh, then maybe the um, four by three ratio is fine for you, and then again, you're, then then you look at well, maybe there's not a big preference. So in that case, what you do is you figure out which one's on sale. <laughs> yeah. Um, now I watch a lot of video, which is in widescreen, so I wanted to fill the whole right. screen instead of the top and black. Uh, yeah, orders. don't like that letter. Um, no, and I actually, that's you know, true. If I did that, if that was what I was going to do on a public access computer or anywhere, I would absolutely want a widescreen. If I was going to do things that were, um, that caused them to letterbox on a four by three. Nope. Yeah. And on my widescreens, I'm one of those weirdos that will take the Vista sidebar, which is down on the right hand side of your screen, and turn it on so it's always on top, and then I still have a lot of my desk space. Mm -hmm. So the widescreen gives me the ability to keep that, and, and I have tools that run on it and things like that. So really, it's, mm -hmm. it's probably going to be preference. And you know, if you've got certain types of desks, won't hold the widescreen monitor. So you know, if they, yeah. that's the yeah, issue, that's that the other thing the too. Furniture. It's furniture. So. Um, the video card itself, basically, uh, on a public access machine, if you're supporting Second Life, then maybe this is an issue. Um, yep. Most public access machines are not doing high intensity gaming, um, you know, installing, um, you know, uh, World, of Warcraft, World, World, World of Warcraft, Halo, right, you know, Counter Strike, things like that. You're not doing those. The things you hear about the Big Bang Theory. Yes, there you go. Um, so, really, in most cases, um, for. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say if you get what's called the Intel onboard video for your typical public access machine, this is going to do you just fine. You don't need a separate video card. You're a home user, you're starting to edit video, you're starting to watch a lot of high definition video, or you're a gamer, then you probably do want a, a, a good solid video card. Check that this, we provided to the system requirements for Second Life, video benchmark links, things like that. I bought a $30 video card, it did everything I needed it to do. Chris is more of a gamer. Um, you know, I know people who spend five hundred dollars on a video card. Yes. Uh, so yeah, she didn't spend that much. She says, oh, but she probably spent more than thirty. I'm guessing. Uh, you can get a good one for a hundred. It really um, doesn't matter. Uh, Kevin's asking in the chat room, what is Second Life? Second Life is the online virtual world uh, where you walk around as an avatar and you interact with other people. Uh, you can find that at SecondLife.com. You can just kind of look that up there. Yeah, 
And a lot of universities and libraries are using it. Um, there are universities offering classes in distance education and second life. So it might be something you'd want to consider offering access to. Uh, don't want to go probably much further on that. Gets a little away from, from our uh, topic right. here today. All right, um, sound. Um, speakers and or headphones as appropriate. Uh, really, you can't not have sound on your public access workstations anymore. Uh, people have to watch YouTube videos for classes. People are communicating that way. Um, headsets are probably the better way to go than um, um, uh, uh, speakers because it's just the noise factor. Right. Um, and really, if you're going to go headsets, get headsets with microphones because people are going to start using uh, things. Right. And you, you, there are websites that don't require you to install software to access the microphone and things like that now. So really, you've got to have the audio going on these machines. And to be honest, whatever audio is built into your machine will be fine. You don't buy separate audio cards anymore unless you're really doing severe high audio engineer. Music, engineer high right. end music. Um, and which music. pretty much if they're doing audio engineering, they probably have their own equipment and they're using right. yours in the library. Um, removable media. Um, DVD, read, write. Really, get the read, write. Yep. Allow people to save stuff to blank C DVDs. Yes. Um, DVD read writes will read and write CDs also. Uh, I know of Just libraries. Say that. Yep. I know of libraries that um, offer blank CDs and DVDs for people to burn stuff to. You know, sell them for fifty cents or a buck a piece. Make a little money on the side. Um, and then I added this thing here. Have plenty of USB ports on the front of the computer um, because people are going to be bringing in their flash drives. That's exactly right. It is. And, it, and and think about that's the other another thing with that too is to think about the placement of your computer and accessibility of those ports because I know here we have people who prefer to have their computers on the floor that basically means they're tipping themselves upside down on a regular basis to put their flash drives in um, and. and the accessibility of the flash drives. Also, um, I have a computer at home that um, has a little door you have to raise. Fortunately, we found out how to make that door disappear when you took the front plate <laughs> off. You can just kind of slide it all the way out and not put it back in. Um, but those kinds of things, I think that you know you've got to have four. Yeah. You know you've got to have two for sure, and four makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Um, uh, media reader writer. Uh, these are your storage cards from cameras and cell phones and things like that. They come in about 50, 60 different styles and sizes and types. More and more computers today are adding those slots right into the front of the computer where the floppy drive used to be. Um, and really, if you can get one of those built into the machine, then people can come That's in with their thing. digital cameras um, and they can do whatever they want with them, and I think that's, um, if you're going to let them use flash drives, let them use their media cards. Right. The difference is, is just not consistent. And I really think that it, I think it's, it's something that I really wanted to stress and made sure got added to this page because it really is an important, an important service for people because a lot of people have cell phones, and, and, a, and a small card reader is not really that expensive to buy. But one that will do all the different formats that you might have in your phone and your camera and your whatever. You know, if you're thinking ahead when you're shopping, you can, yes, you can say, okay, I'm only going to use this format. I'm going to use the mini SD because I'm put it in a carrier and I can blah, blah. And there's just this whole range of things if you're planning. But who buys things that way? <laughs> almost nobody. I mean, almost nobody. It's like my um, cell phone provider has a deal on this phone and I, my contract is up and I can get it for 15 bucks. So I'm going to take that, and then you find it uses this weird card, and then you, know, you have a camera that you got a long time ago, and it uses some weird card, because, let's see, what was before SD? There's some other... Well, there's SD, there's mini SD, there's micro SD. No, yeah, but there was one before Compact SD, flash. Compact, yeah, there was some sort of compact flash. Like, oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Not... I used duplexing to save paper, and now I can't find anything. <laughs> um, you know, those kinds of things. So... If you can trade off for your patrons um, some other thing and get that optional media reader, 
that does five or six different kinds of cards, I think they'll really appreciate that. If you have people who are, you know, who have who have come in to try to do photos or to be able to advertise that you can do that, I think it probably is worth it. And what she said, five or six. These things will usually have four or five different slots in them. Slots, right. But they'll say we read and write 56 different kinds of media. Um, you know, because a lot of times the it'll use the same slot, but for a different manufacturer standard. Um, so just look for the bigger the number, the better, and and really it'll just work at that point. I mean, it's not worth the mint, but it's it's worth making a making a, an effort to. Provide. And they're they're really coming built in. Uh, so. And uh, we had a comment come through the text chat that uh, some monitors have USB ports on them now. And yeah, that's great. I mean, Boy, if you're buying a monitor and you can do that, that's good too. Yeah, it's even better. Okay, um, keyboard and mouse. Um, it's going to come with a keyboard and a mouse. Whether <laughs> um, really you want it to or not. Actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, you know, sometimes I wish I could. I, I think I have three or four extra keyboards in my, in my house because I keep wanting to use my same keyboard that I move from computer to computer. Because you get uh, used to it, you like it. Um, really, PS2 is kind of the older standard. It's more of a, a round plug right. in the back of computers. Most computers will still come with those plugs, but most newer uh, computers are almost... I, don't, I haven't found a USB keyboard and mouse coming with a computer in... in not coming with... Not me, me, yeah. yeah, now it's, it's not, USB. It's always USB. It's mouse. almost always USB now. Um, some people will get a USB to PS2 adapters to save the USB port. Um, really, at this point, it's it's pretty much transparent. One keyboard, one mouse will work to another. Um, I recommend sticking to the laser mice. I'll throw that in because then the kitties can't steal the balls out of the mice. Um, yes. Well, really, we, we, you know, we don't have to talk about that. So. That's, yeah. that's about it. Yeah. Um, well, so. And they stay a lot cleaner. It's just a lot easier to deal with it. Yeah. And, and any of these, we, we got a note there, you know, just mentioning that if you're dealing with or, or mice or trackballs or barcode readers, if you're talking staff machines, any of those things, most of them are going to be USB at this point if you're buying new equipment. Is that USB pretty much is the standard for connecting all devices. That's why it's called the universal serial bus. Um, if so. you're trying to reuse devices, Printers USB. Then, if you're going, if you're going to be reusing devices, uh, and that's an, another thing you need to to be sure that you take note of whether or not these reusable devices are going to work on the computer that you're buying. You may just find that there's not a computer out there that will allow you to do that, and that will be sad, and you will feel bad about the investment <laughs> that you made in this this yada yada whatever thing. But it's just time to say goodbye. Um, yeah, I, there's there's no way to deal with it. You know, you just think some things do just become outdated, and it's a sad fact of life. When you know, as Michael said, he just spent half as much for the same thing he bought three months ago, and um, or what five months ago, and it's um, things just get they're out of date really fast, and there's no way to say this is. Things just don't last forever anymore. Yeah, I've, I bought a top, about 15 years ago. I bought a top of the line HP flatbed scanner, and it works beautifully. And I spent $1,500 on it. Wow! I and it's what's called SCSI. Oh my gosh! I don't think it'll plug into my new computer anymore. I have to move a car. I don't even know if the card that it connected to inside my old computer will plug into my new computer. Um, so uh, I'm running, no. I'm running an old computer just to keep that running. And at this point, though, no, it, it and sometimes one, that's an option. If you one have day, space. it's gonna give up the ghost. It's gonna have to, but it still works. That's the problem. The so. printer I bought last year is a printer copier scanner for like less than hundred bucks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, but anyway, there's yeah. other issues why Sorry. I like it. But yeah, go ahead. Um, networking, um, and this is network card. Actually, most networking is now built into the mother. Board. You don't actually buy a separate card anymore. We are recommending what's known as gigabit Ethernet, which means a gigabit per second transfer rate. Um, what it might come with is called a 10 slash 100 Ethernet card. It's just future future proofing at this point. Gigabit is better, is faster, is newer. It will work with an older network. It will work with forthcoming right. networks. Right. 
I, you know, go with the ten, go with the thousand. So it could say like ten, one hundred, one thousand, whatever. But that's, that's gotta be that one thousand. That's the data base. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm mixed here. I mean, if it, how, how okay, let me ask Diane in this way. If, if it came with a 10100 card, but you would have to pay extra to go to Gigabit, how much would you be willing to pay? I have no idea. <laughs> that is way, I, you know, if somebody specifically has that question, we can probably find out, you know, kind of give a ballpark idea, get enough get enough people weighing in on the thing but um, I don't know I just I think it's kind of just we know that it makes a difference we you know and so you know if you're gonna it depends what people are doing across your network and right. it's always really difficult to anticipate you know small libraries that didn't have you know any kind of automation at all five years ago could not anticipate now that they have, you know, a couple of network computers. So, you know, the the idea that, you know, it's just hard to anticipate and network traffic congestion is a problem and it makes people's work experience and their their computing experience for public access just in general, the computing experience really frustrating. And so it seems worth it to me. Mm -hmm. And I and I that's why we made it. It seemed worth it to the whole computer team when we put this up. As right. Well. You know, these are recommendations. And They're not know, hard and fast rules. No. If you manage, if you have a great deal and there's something that's you know out there that's you know going to allow you to get three computers instead of one or you know two or something, well, right. you know, perhaps in a not very you know with people not doing a lot, you know, there's going to be your situation where that's just a perfectly good trade off. And you know, I'm trying to stream high definition video through my house, so I want to get a bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, printers, your choices are ink jet or laser. Um, I am a firm believer that laser printers are better, they're more cost effective, they are going to last longer, they tend not to break. I've seen those things where you know, if you think four bucks for a latte at Starbucks is, is uh, a high price, uh, ink in an inkjet printer works out to a couple hundred bucks a gallon or something like this. I mean, this stuff is expensive. That's why inkjet printers are basically given away for free with computers just because they're going to get you on the ink. At home, I have a laser printer. I paid a hundred bucks for it. It's a Dell laser printer. I buy one cartridge a year for 70 bucks. Now, granted, a public printer is going to get more use, but Honestly, you're going to get, I think, a better deal in the long run out of investing in a good laser printer. Uh, and even if you want to go color, the color prices have gone down. And I, I would agree with that. I think particularly in a public situation, you don't want to be dealing with um, constantly having ink problems. I think jets are, you know, they're, they're fragile. They're, you know, loading the cartridges. You know, if you're doing one at home and, you know, and that's then you know you kind of learn the way that yours works and whatever but you know out in a public environment you know people are going to want to like lift the lid and shake the car you know whatever because that's what they do when they're bu you're busy and they don't want to bother you because it's just something silly and if they they've known that you could do this from when they had one or when whatever or you know so it seems to me that it has a great deal of um I don't know, it makes a lot of sense to invest in that color laser printer is more expensive, but they have come down so much that, you know, if you can do that, it's probably a good thing. And if you can't, there are places that that now respectably, I mean, do a, res a pretty good job of refilling ink cartridges. Mm -hmm. And so if that really is what you have, if that's what you're going to do, then, you know, investigate that and see who's, who's got that business going in your area and whether it's cost effective and what, people, what their reputation is among people who are using the service. 
All right, I'm, I'm noticing the time here, so when I would keep moving along here, we were, somebody was concerned we weren't going to have enough to say. Probably. <laughs> Diane and I not having enough to say, right. Okay. Um, so let's talk about laptops real quick. This is uh, sort of the, the catch-all slide. What do you want? Weight, screen size, battery life. Um, I added there the, the higher number of cells, the longer the battery life will yes. be, but it will also weigh more. Yep. Um, you know, how does the keyboard feel? How big is the keyboard? You're getting these little netbooks now, which cost about 400 bucks, but the keyboards are like 50% of an abnormal <laughs> keyboard. So if you're a touch typist with big fat fingers, those are not going to work. Um, you know, you, you need a bag to carry it around in. Um, Whenever somebody says, I'm looking to buy a laptop, the first question I ask them is, why do you want a laptop? Uh, and, you know, it, I don't think for public access PCs, laptops are the solution. I, in libraries, I think desktops. You don't want those things to move. They are a little more fragile. They, they yes. are a little more touchy. You can't just swap out the monitor. If the monitor goes bad, it's the whole thing. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't get laptops for, you know, maybe staff uh, if they need to be moving around, things like that. Some libraries um, have a space for these Right. Lap yes, laptops, laptops taking the less space. And, exactly. Or maybe you want to be able, your patrons to be able to move around the library and act, use the whole library, whatever place that they have, if you have wireless, but it's yep. comfortable for them to work in. And we just it's, gave them a bunch of libraries laptops. You know, so, you it's know, new, that's <laughs> it's new, the, you know, the whatever area of the library they're used to. Right. Well, laptops you know. give the library those things for you because they don't, you don't have to have a designated desk that is or area that this is always just for the computer. You can keep them right. behind your cert desk, check them out, and then just use them as they need so they can, like I said, go anywhere in the True. library. So right. smaller mm -hmm. size libraries can have a, a, a bank of computer, public access computers that are laptops. Mm -hmm. And yeah. overall, a laptop, an equivalent laptop to a desktop, will probably cost a little more. Oh yeah. So that's you Without know a doubt. something. That and you know, in that case, if you, I would say, if you're really looking for, you know, if this is for public access laptops, do think about the thing that feels the sturdiest. For public access laptops, they're not going to carry them very far. They're not, you know, they're. Um, the battery life is probably an important issue then, although you may have checkout times where, you know, if they're not being used back to back to back, there'll be some research, re recharge time. Um, so, you know, weight may not be the biggest issue on a public access laptop. True. Um, so then you might want to think about the screen size and the, the keyboard touch and feel as the primary <coughs> things, because again, your hard drive size is not that essential, but burning a DVD, that's a big deal. Now, the thing to, to remember is that some of the little, um, the littler laptops now, the netbook kind of thing, they do not have, we have an optical drive. We do? We do have a slide for that. Okay. It's after well, the next one. It's so we'll come back okay. to that one. Um, <laughs> Wi-Fi. Okay, if you're talking laptops, you're generally talking wireless internet access. Um, okay, this is where we start talking numbers and letters again, but you basically want to make sure that it, there, there's A, which has gone by the wayside. Nobody uses right. A yeah, anymore. Say. And there's B, which is kind of the slow, and then there's G, which is kind of the standard right now. You want to make sure that your Wi-Fi supports B, AMG. That's that is the standard. You you can't get any less than that. There is now what's called wireless or 802.11n. I am actually using n in my house, so I have some experience with this. N is faster. N is a stronger signal, and N will go is a further signal. It will it will increase your range. However, it's still what's called a draft. It hasn't been finalized. Um, so if you're one of those people that like, you know, don't like to use beta software, you might not want to consider going to wireless N at this point. If you can get your laptop to support N and you don't offer N, well, you're kind of future-proofing. But you're future-proofing against something that still might change. Right. And here's the other thing I've learned the, kind of the hard way in my own house is if you go with wireless and you want to make sure all the equipment is from the same company. So I have like all Belkin wireless equipment because some companies implement it slightly differently. Oh, that 
Yeah. yeah that's a, so that's the honestly, unless you're like me and you want it, avoid it at this point. It's not final yet. I, I guess that that's my best recommendation. I know I've been dealing with it for three months now. <laughs> um, as to drives, um, laptops might. I, I, same recommendations really as with the desktops. Get a DVD yes, RW. Absolutely. Um, but you start getting the really small, the really lightweight ones. They're not going to have one of those optical drives at all. Yep. So I added to this slide, um, you might then want to consider getting a USB DVD drive so that if somebody does need to read a DVD on the laptop or write a DVD from the laptop, you can check that out to them. They can use it and then return it. Wow. I would never recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> Told you, we did not plan this at all. Well, I'm just okay, thinking. why would you not recommend that? Okay, we have one of these. Okay. We have one. Yes. And so you're, you know, I guess it just seems to me that if you're going to buy laptops for people to use, they need to have the things that they're going to use okay. them for. And so, you know, if you have people who use DVDs, who want to play them, want to watch them privately using your equipment, who want to burn them from resources that they're finding, whatever, it, it, to ask them to come back and get another thing, or to remember to ask for it, or to keep track of the, okay, so you have three laptops, one drive. Two of them have, okay, one of them has a drive, but yeah, and you have one drive. Or a lot of times they come, you have to buy the external drive with the thing, and so to keep track of it. And did they both come back? Did they come back and get one? I'm thinking, whoa, I, okay. I, I do not need this headache. Let, let I me, do not let need me this clarify headache. my position. <laughs> okay. Right off the top. You want it built in. That is the preference. That is a preference. Okay, that's totally the preference. And for a public access machine, yeah. I mean, definitely, if that's you're the option. you're looking at a staff thing. Now, yeah, if you want to get a little tiny staff computer so the reference people can wander around the building and do reference without standing at the reference desk. Yes. Okay. But at some point, you're going to need to install software off of a DVD. Then, you know, get the little netbook, get the thing that doesn't have the drive built in and then add the drive when you need it. But, you know, yeah, especially for public access, the, the better choice is going to be a built-in drive. I, I just I really... clarify what I'm saying there. But, <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, that consider having a USB one is if you don't and you had a good reason for not getting it right, built exactly. in the first place. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll leave that <laughs> there then. Okay, odds and ends that are pretty much going to apply across the board. Um, support warranties. You're on your home. No. <laughs> um, I sometimes get the extended warranty. I have had a situation where my laptop died. I sent it back to Gateway two years after I bought it, and they completely fixed the whole thing and shipped it back to me, and it couldn't, didn't cost a dime. Then there's the times where you have a computer and nothing goes wrong ever with it that you can't fix yourself and you wasted $300 on the extended warranty. It's how comfortable are you fixing it? Are you, you know, do you like the extended warranties? Is it on the laptops? I'm telling you, though, sometimes that 100% replacement, even if you drop the darn thing in a broken half, they will replace it can be worth it if you're checking out laptops to the public. It's really yeah. going to be your call on this one. Um, and I can say again, this is the place where um, working through your government entity may help you some because the warranties tend to, um, they're packaged a little bit differently for um, uh, city state government. Kind of thing, so sometimes that may that may make a big difference over what just the consumer warranty is, and um, I, I think it's really it's a hard call. Again, it's like you know, how long do you expect to tap to last? Um, what's going to be going on with it? You know, how far is it moving? What kind of 
what kind of stability is the furniture that it's on. I mean, you know, there are a ton of things that you have to look at your own environment and make a decision about whether that money is, is going to be well spent or not. It's a tough one. Yeah. All right, we got just a couple of quick more slides here to point you out, and I will admit there is more detail about some of this stuff on the actual web page, which I believe is linked on our last slide. Yeah. Um, software. You can get discounted software through Nebraska Department of Education, um, through Soft Choice, and through TechSoup. You can get Microsoft Office for like 20 bucks through TechSoup. TechSoup right. you, you've got to check these out. If you've never looked at these websites, if you, TechSoup is public library specific, so I don't know if we've got any academics or, or specials in the audience. Yeah. Um, but I'm telling you, if you've never looked at TechSoup, look at TechSoup. You can get the most amazing software for the for like a processing fee of $12. I mean, it, it's unreal it's, the deals you can get through these sites. That is true. However, okay. one of the things about TechSoup is there's, um, I will find and um, find and find a way to get to you the link to the webinar that TechSoup did a couple, like last month, I believe. Hmm. And when they really describe what their software program is about for public libraries. Okay. And that was really helpful because there are caveats to the whole thing. No. Yeah, you can get it. You can buy this many things over a two-year period. Uh, and then okay. you can, I mean, there are... It, it's a finesse thing. You have Some it. restrictions may apply. Some of the details. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly the thing. It was very informative. It was really interesting to listen to the audio of that. How, how about we put a link to that webinar recording on the um, the, the web page, the yep. recommendations web that. page. We will add it to that web page, and you can get to it from there. Um, additional resources, uh, here is the link to that recommendation webpage we've been talking about. Um, uh, uh, recommend that HTML there on our website. We've also linked to a um, computer maintenance and security checklist and another computer maintenance checklist. So some just additional things for kind of long-term playing around with. Oh my with. gosh, we've got four minutes left and I haven't said this, Michael. Oh. I have to say this. Okay, Diane has something to say. I have to say this. I have well, to say. only 49 minutes to this section. We've got to do a five after. Okay. We okay. got time. Okay. Diane needs to say. I need to say that one of the things that I, that, that I really, I think is really important is in addition to looking at the kind of hardware deal that you can get for the money that you have, including, you know, whatever stuff or whatever, that before you actually purchase something, you have a plan for what you're going to do about virus protection, what you're going to do for spyware. What are you going to do about backups? If if you're working with um, if you're working with uh, actual staff computers, I think Diane just described another session. Um, <laughs> but I, it just it really is something that if, that I think is is really important because the problem is once you have it on the desks, it can't not be used. Mm -hmm. You're going to hook it up, you're going to go on the internet, and are you ready? Are you ready? Do you have updates? Do you have automatic updates turned on so that all your software packages will be automatically installed? Do you have, you know, do you have a backup plan so that when, when you have that catastrophic failure, when whatever, that those files are somewhere else, they're not just sitting on a single hard drive on a machine? You know, that you have a plan, you know where the stuff is, and that you know how to get to it, and it's regular. Now, these these um, two checklists that are listed here um, both talk about that um, in some way. If you go to Microsoft and search on um, security and maintenance, they have a page that has various links, and I'm sure it's heavy on using Microsoft products and whatever. But you still get good information out of that. So I just didn't want us to stop at this to end oh, this no, without and saying, you know, yeah, it's great to have the thing on the desk, but to keep it working and to be sure that it's not out there, that it's not sitting on that desk sending robot messages for, you know, some some place on another continent to everyone you know, just to random people. Um, it's, 
you know, it, it's just important. And and I do know that Diane and I agree on the concepts, but on the implementation, we, sure. we, we do have some differences of opinion on how to do these things. So I, I'm actually going to say a lot. I think we need to do another session just on that. I, I, I And that would be a very interesting conversation. So sure. I, I, yeah, OK, I guess we've just promised. Uh, give us a little time. <laughs> Chris has got the schedule. Um, probably at least a month or two. But I, I think we can come back to that. I think we, you and I could go for an hour on that without well, even and thinking about there it. There are other people here um, who, are, who do a lot more with that kind of thing. Separate, yeah, other, so. yeah, get six computer people in the room. You'll get six different opinions <laughs> uh, on those topics. Definitely. Oh. Um, okay, it is 11, but we started five minutes late, so we still have five minutes. Um, are there any questions um, about what we talked about or maybe some other issues that we can maybe address that we haven't for you already? Um, if you want to do it via audio, go ahead and click the raise your hand button, um, or just go ahead and type it right into the text chat, and we will see that we do have that open on our screen. And we will be happy to attempt to address any of those issues. Silence. Quiet. I know it does say some time to type in the chat. So. Yeah, so we're, we're not giving you a hard time. We should play the Jeopardy music though the next time. Yeah, I think we'll, you know, get, get that get that going through. Um, but um, you are, I will throw up while we're seeing if there's any, our, our last, our contact information there. I mean, feel free, give us a shout. Um, I've had several libraries in the last couple of months actually send me, we got a bid on computers and sent me the bid and asked me what I thought of it. Um, and uh, then sometimes I go to Diane and I'm like, what do you think about this? Because I'm not no, sure. No, mostly you go to um, somebody else and do that. <laughs> and um, I've actually sent them back and said, look, you really need another bid because this is way too much for what you're asking for. I think that one was a server, though. So yeah. I, I, I asked a few other people. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we will offer what help we can. Uh, will I be able to print out additional resources information, which information in particular the research, the previous URLs. oh the previous okay. URLs those URLs are actually on this web page where is my asterisk this one here. is really the key one yeah everything that's on here that is URLs these and anything else will be in put into the library commission's delicious account which will be linked off of the uh, recording when this it is this recording is, is put up onto our website this afternoon so all of these URLs will have in there and you can click on them and yeah explore all these pages print off every anything and everything that you want to so i'll have all those, all these URLs collected in one place if you didn't catch them off of the slides here um so that you have easy access to all of them um any other questions what about my local computer store that gives me a good price but won't give me the original Microsoft disks? Okay, my gut reaction is, why the heck wouldn't they? Oh, but you don't get them hardly at all. You only get restore software. Well, okay. I, well, good point. Depends on what you... you know, some computers now, you get no physical media, and then when you set up the computer, it says, would you like to create your disks now? Um, or there is some other software package that you're supposed to run. If that's what they're doing, that's okay. But if they're just installing Office and not giving you the disks or not giving you a way to create disks, I, I, that makes me nervous. I don't know that much about it. I would Apparently have to. Should they give you the key? The right, but well, and, and they should be giving you the key. But sure. how do you ever reinstall it if your computer completely dies if you don't have physical media? Yeah. And I would ask I would ask them some questions. That that would I would say would be non standard practice. I don't know. Mainly because we're all got really confused expressions on their face. Yeah, um, we do. They have one set of disks and they install it on many computers. Um, do you have your own license key then, Kevin? Okay, because we do that here at the commission. We buy a license for multiple, for multiple computers. computers. Right. But we're all in the same organization. I don't think that a computer store can just 
do that. There may be something we don't know about. True. Let's let's, yeah. let's do what we can find out and, and try to get back and yes. find a place to put that information. Send us an email maybe with a little more detail um, to remind us to, to poke around into that. But i got to be honest, I want physical media somehow. Because I may have to at, burn it myself. At but. some point, well, for example, I've bought... I bought Office 2007, and I installed it on a computer, um, and then I got a new computer, so I uninstalled it from the first one and wanted to install it on the second one. So I'm, I'm still legal. I still only got installed on one computer, but without physical media, I couldn't have done that. Right. So, yeah, I, I want physical media. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I left it. Yeah, send, send us an email. We can yeah. we can poke around on that one. All right. Anything else before we uh, shut things down here? Let let Chris take the big camera okay. here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, as you guys all know, oh, we're getting some applause. Yay! Oh, yay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, as usual, this has been recorded and will, will be available. It should be, I should have it up this afternoon. Um, as they said, with all the URLs and everything, um, you can contact, of course, Michael and Diane with any questions you do come up with in the future that they have not answered here. Um, if there's nothing else urgent, nothing else you guys need to say, then we are done. Thank you very much for attending. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.